wellnesscouch.com, streaming wellness into your lives. You're listening to A Quirky Journey, the healthy family podcast with your hosts, Joe Witten and Leah Follett. Welcome to A Quirky Journey. Join us as we share our family's journeys to good health. You'll find plenty of inspiration, tips and recipe ideas, as well as stories from everyday people who've struggled and overcome health problems and diet challenges in their own families. I'm Jo Witten, author of the blog and book Quirky Cooking, and I'm here with my friend and co-host Leah Follett. Hi, Leah. Hi, Jo. How are you? Good. We're going off on a bit of a tangent today, aren't we? Oh, we are. We're going to do some really big sharing today. We are. Big sharing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so be ready. No. <laughs> um, we both... Uh, homeschooling mums, Leah and I, and we both get a lot of questions about homeschooling. So we decided we might as well go ahead and do a podcast about it um, because then that's an easy way to answer those questions and it is part of our journeys and that's what this podcast is all about is our journeys to good health and part of the journeys for us have included homeschooling and we will explain why today. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yes. But it wasn't the reason why we met. We didn't meet in homeschooling no, circles. We, didn't. we met in health and wellness circles through yes. Duard, through our, yes. our our amazing chef friend who yes. just decided that we had to be BFFs and we were destined <laughs> to be BFFs. So and we just happened to both homeschool. So that was, I know that, so worked that was well. yeah that was a bit that was astounding actually. Yes. Having a phone call with you and oh yeah they're like how are you doing and what do you do and oh I'm a homeschool mum. It's like wow I've met another one. Yes. So it's people. <laughs> I think it's becoming a little more commonplace. Oh, I think it I think, has. Definitely. I think it's definitely growing. But everyone's got their own reasons as to why they homeschool and their own ways of doing it. Yeah, and definitely the benefits are, and disadvantages are, are different for every single household as well. So it's and it changes, and it changes as the kids grow. And some people we know, people who've done homeschooling for part of the journey and public school for part of the journey, um, and we have done that ourselves. So we'll talk about mm-hmm. all that today and why and how and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I think you should start first, Joe, because your kids are a little bit older than than mine. Okay. Um. So you're, yeah, you, know, you know, like you're kind of the matriarch on this thing. So you, you go first. <laughs> you take the lead. Okay. This does not mean that I'm the perfect homeschooling mum. Okay. <laughs> no, but <laughs> but we're mine, sharing our experiences. But here. that's your approach too. So yeah. mine's completely different, and no one can judge anyone else's thing. It's just like you can't measure your kid against anyone no, else's. Homeschooling right. is exactly the same. And if. If you measure your children's schooling success in whether, to me, it's the most important thing is to teach them a love of learning because mm-hmm. obviously reading and writing and arithmetic, but if they have a love of learning, they will learn anything and they can do anything and go anywhere in life. And so to me, that's the most important thing is for them to love learning and mm-hmm. for our children to love learning, we needed to homeschool because they weren't loving it at school. <laughs> Okay, so we started off in the public school system. Um, My daughter, India, went to the end of grade two in public school and we just found it a little bit, I don't know, we didn't quite fit. Um, She didn't quite fit the box (laughs) and neither did Simi, who was in preschool up to the end of preschool when we finished up with with, um, public schooling. Um, We knew a lot of people that homeschooled and... When I first sort of thought about homeschooling, it was always like, no, 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 I wouldn't do that. My kids will turn out weird. I don't want to homeschool. And then my sister started homeschooling, my little sister, and people would say to me, oh, are you going to homeschool like your sister? I was like, no way. Are you kidding me? She's mad. (laughs) (laughs) Obviously, you should never say never. I also said I'd never have four kids and I had four kids. So (laughs) um, I I was just like adamant that I would never homeschool, that I thought a kid needed to be in the real world, in school, getting, you know, bumped around by life so that they turn out strong. Um, That's how it was meant to be. Um, The bumps were pretty tough. (laughs) And my daughter could not understand maths at all. She, by the end of grade two, she still didn't understand maths at all. Um, she would cry at school. She didn't cope well at all. She couldn't, I couldn't even, you know, I just felt like she wasn't even eating properly at school because 
she was stressed with school and then she'd get kept in to do work because she didn't finish because she didn't understand it and so she wouldn't eat her lunch and that kind of thing didn't sit well with me at that age I just felt like that was not how school was meant to be for a young child that's not teaching them a love of learning to me so we decided to go ahead and homeschool and when we took our kids out of school we went through a distance ed group who um use the ACE program and so we taught our kids for, with that for a few years but it was pretty much just school at home so you still had all the workbooks you still had supervisors you still had like I had to do a course to do some training um, so that I would know how to teach them um, and it was really good for you know especially for beginners with school and for mums that don't have a lot of time you know you've got babies you've got little ones it was good um, I just found that as they got older, we got a bit bored with it. So we ch changed things around. Um, we went to literature-based schooling where, I don't know if anyone's heard of the Charlotte Mason method, that's sort of more where we went. So it's more of a natural learning approach. You still use workbooks. You still you read a lot together as a family and the kids also read on their own. Um, when they're little, they they speak what they've learnt to you. So after you finish reading, then they speak back to you what they've learnt to, so that it helps you to see if they've actually taken it in. It's like writing an essay but doing it in words not write, written on paper. So when uh -huh. they're little and they're just learning to write, it's difficult for them to be creative and to write really well as well as form the letters, do it neatly. It's all too much. Uh -huh. So they would speak it back to us. And yes. then as they got older, they'd begin to write things down more until they were writing stories and book reports and things. Um, they had their own maths books so that they were all, you know, at their own level for that. They had their own spelling, so they were at their own level for that. Um, but we just did things more like that and we really, really enjoyed it. We used a curriculum called Sunlight, S-O-N-L-I-G-H-T, and um, the books are absolutely gorgeous loved it the kids loved the reading time the family and it was very bonding I found that the kids could just sit together um, the kids would draw paint play with lego play with play-doh do so I would make sure they had something to do with their hands because they were young you know and they needed to sit still so all around the table all doing something with their hands my eldest often knitted she still does that um, while I read to them so that was a really nice time for us to spend together and discussing things at times it was hard because my eldest boy is very wiggly <laughs> and he would, you know, interrupt a lot. But it was also his way of finding out answers to constantly interrupt and ask, ask, ask. So I guess you've got to sort of take that in and say, okay, well, that's not such a bad thing. We got to the stage where I was really, really busy with work and because I work from home and I decided to go back to the simpler way of schooling with everybody had their own workbooks, everybody works alone. They only come to me if they need help with something. So we went back to that for a while through a local uh, private school and um, that worked okay for a while but we found that the kids liked learning less and less <laughs> until we got to the stage where Every day was a really major effort. No one was happy. The schooling wasn't going well because they'd really lost interest. So we changed again. And this year we're back to sunlight. The kids are so excited again. They love sunlight. They love being able to be more flexible with the homeschooling. So basically we go through the government system of homeschooling, put in a paper saying what we're going to do and get that approved. So that's what we're working on this year. So that's a brief overview. Does, do you want to ask any questions there, Leah? <laughs> well, yeah, while we're talking about you and mm -hmm. before we get on to me, okay. um, how, like, what does your day look like? I, okay. I know that that's, that's something I get asked a lot. Mm. So, yep. you know, like how much, how much time do you invest and do the kids invest in their, that part of their education? Okay. So when they were little, I found it was only two or three hours a day of homeschooling and that was it. You were done for the day. Um, so we'd, you know, have breakfast, we'd do all the brush teeth jobs, make your beds, all that kind of stuff. So that's all out of the way. And then we would sit down and read together and then get start straight into maths and English, do the most important ones first because that's when they're thinking the clearest. Um, when they were little, I'd give them lots of little breaks. So they'd, you know, they might work for, depends on the kid, um, Simi, like I said, is very jumpy <laughs> mm -hmm. so he'd have to get up and run around the house or get up and 
you know, get outside for a minute or change activities quite often. Even sometimes every 10 or 15 minutes you have to change the activity. So he was pretty full on when he was little. Mm -hmm. Um, As they got older, now they're obviously, well, now they're 17, 15, 13 and 11. So they can work for hours and they're fine. They'll get up and go have a break, just like at school, morning tea, lunch, afternoon tea. Um, But we always try to start with some family time reading together and figuring out what they're going to do for the day, writing down their goals um, so that that's laid out before they even begin. And then they get into their work and with this sunlight type of doing things, the literature-based schooling, um, we read a lot more together, both in the morning and at night or at least after lunch if we can't do night. And then they also have things that they read on their own and write, and I just check their writing. Um, they Basically, it's more of a school day, maybe a bit shorter, and it's more flexible, obviously. I think, mm-hmm. I think what a lot of people think of with school, with homeschooling, is that it's just school at home, So the mum has to sit there by the children the whole time teaching them and how in the world does she get anything else done, which is not how it looks in our home. It might for some because Mm -hmm. everybody does things differently. But for me, I'm more of a natural approach type learner and I do want the kids to be as independent as possible. So Mm -hmm. um, as much as possible, I get like at the moment we're doing maths online for maths now. Mm -hmm. Um, which is the Australian Curriculum Maths, and it keeps all the reports. It teaches them how to do it with videos. It's got the worksheets. It it scores everything. That takes a big load off me. So the kids can do that on their own, and they only really call me if they desperately need help. But most of the time it's stuff they can go back and watch the video again, um, and then they'll be okay. But what I do is just stay close. So I'll be in the kitchen and they're at the dining table, and it's all big open room, um, and they will just work with me there calling me if they need me or come to me if they need me to sign something or check something. And I'm cooking, I'm working on the computer, I'm answering the phone, I'm answering emails. The whole time school's going on unless they need me to sit down and read to them or, or score something with them. So it's not like um, me standing in front of a classroom teaching all day. It's not the same. It's almost like, it sounds like it's like an, um, an office environment. Yes, everybody's really? working. Everyone's working, everyone's got their consignments of work and everyone knows what they have to do and and when they have to achieve it by. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's important to have, especially for kids, you know, they need to have a plan and know what they're working towards because otherwise it's really all over the place. And today's been a bit all over the place because it's the first day back to school. And, yeah. um, and that's kind of reason why we're doing the podcast is yeah. because, you know, like through Facebook this morning, I saw all these little kids with their little Uniforms hats on, on and their hats are huge. They look like sombreros. And by the end of the year, they would have grown into them. But, you know, like they just look so cute and pressed in their uniforms. And oh, I remember being there that first yeah. day of school in a uniform. Yeah. It's a so big deal. Everybody's everybody's getting back to school and this is just how we do it. We're not saying you have to do it our way and we're not saying that public school is bad or anything like no, that. No, it's just that no. we get a lot of questions yeah. and I think people because it is different. It is different. Um it's so quirky. yeah, we just want to we just want to share. <laughs> yeah. We just want to share. So that's that's how it looks for us. How about mm. you Leah? What do you want to explain your story? Okay. Well, we started William off, mine's a bit of an autism story, so mm-hmm. we started William off, um, he started pre-prep and then went into prep and grade one and at the start of grade one, we, you know, the teachers kept saying, hey, look, he's not hitting his milestones, he's falling further behind and then we went through the whole diagnostic thing and once we were diagnosed, we went back to the school and the school actually sent us, they advised us to go and see their speechy and, mm-hmm. you know, like we were doing OT and we were doing all these other things, these other therapies to try and bring him along and encourage him and get him back up to speed. And at some point the school just sort of turned around and, and before we started back into the second term of grade two, they said, look, we just can't cater to William's learning needs. We're not set up that way. We don't have facility. Uh, and they gave us a list of other schools that would, assist him and I'm grateful for that at the time I was devastated that a private school would turn around and say hey look you don't fit our community Mm. and it was an Anglican school and and, I mean that's where my faith was Mm -hmm. so for them like that was my epicenter that was my community and and for them and the school to be able to say turn around and say 
hey, look, you don't fit our community or our environment. And I'm you know, like, we had our child baptized there. It was like, it was a big deal. Mm. It was like they had sort of, I know that they didn't, but I internalized it as though that they were turning their back on us when oh, we needed them. That's sad. So, but now I can see that, yeah, okay, we didn't fit that. And it's taken me a few years of reflection to get to that point. So yeah. I still really appreciate the school and the time that they invested in us. And if they didn't give us the kick up the bum, then we wouldn't be in the place we are now. Yeah. So I'm all very, very, work out all those, good. they do. <laughs> and I would, I look it back at our principal and he's sitting there and being able to, well, having to tell these parents about their child and know we that would be an extremely hard thing yeah. for anyone to do. So I'm I'm very blessed and, and I won't mention any names but, I'm, you know, like <laughs> if she ever hears any of this at the time, it didn't feel great but now looking on it, back on it, I just, oh, reflection and the years that have gone by, I'm just so excited for that. Anyway, we ended up going to a state school because they were set up to accommodate him and we did mm, almost two years there. So we gave it a really good go. We went through the verification process, which for anyone who hasn't got autistic children, you get your diagnosis and you take the paperwork back to the school and then it has to be verified through um, their channels to get funding to support your kid. Mm. Uh, So that took the longest time to come through. And when it did, because of the age William was at, we had missed out on the early intervention funding. Mm. And early intervention funding, I think, is around maybe eight or ten thousand dollars, you know, per child with a diagnosis, depending on the diagnosis, in a year. And you know that the school negotiates with the parents what they need as far as resources. So it might be physical resources like hands-on stuff or little wiggle cushions. It might be sensory stuff. It might be time spent with OT or speech where you've got someone coming to the school. Mm -hmm. So it's highly individualized as well. But by the time we got our diagnosis, because we were one of those parents, we just sort of thought, oh yeah, William's quiet. He's just a little immature. He'll grow into himself. And we didn't realize that because he was so similar to Mark in his behaviors. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we just put it down to, oh, he's just like his dad. Um, And I suppose like I've got a brilliant friend, I've got Curtis, who you know, Mm Joe. Yes. He he knew that there was something different about our kid, but he never felt it was his place to say no. either. And, like, I don't think I would have been able to hear it from him at the time. Mm-hmm. It was something that we had to find out on our own, and which yep. we did. But, you know, after our diagnosis and after we got all the – because you grieve. After you get a diagnosis, it's just like, well, what does this mean? Because you have an idea of – you know, like your child's not going to be able to do this. And for me, it was like I only knew a handful of autistic kids. And and for me, it was like they were physically impaired and mentally impaired. And I couldn't then understand what that meant for my kid and his growing up. Mm. So then to bring all that back into a classroom, well, what does my kid need? And I didn't actually then know my child. I knew him emotionally, but I didn't know what he needed, you know, from a schooling or an educational perspective. So I really struggled with that. And we tried to fit in with the school as best we could. But the more I found out about the autism, the more I went to the conferences, the more parents I met, the more doctors I saw, we started going down the road of, you know, fix the gut and do all of this and do all that. And it was so hard to bring that into the school Mm -hmm. because, you know, there's so many food and allergies and we were on such a highly restricted diet and the things that we were going to nourish my kid weren't um, really allowed at the school because uh, of other kids and their allergies. So William would have to um, sit away from the other kids because we couldn't back down. You know, what are we going to feed him? He can't have bread. He can't have, yeah. you know, all those other foods, including the fruits, including the snack things that we would have loved to been able to send with our child that mm. are all healthy, you know, type things. We had to, you know, we wanted to send with eggs and we wanted to send some nut and seed breads and we couldn't do it. Mm. We got it's permission for it. We did. We got permission, but William had to be set away from his community, like his little community or his little classroom. And for, you know, grade two, they'd have all the kids sitting in lines. And then at the end of you, you eat your lunch, then you've got to show your lunchbox to the teacher and wash up before you go out to play. Now, William would have to go and sit by himself. Mm. So if anyone understands, you it's know, hard. like when, when you're eating together, like, the, you know, like there are chemicals released in your brain, you release oxytocin. When you're sharing a, a meal with someone, you release oxytocin in your brain, which is a huge bonding thing. That's the chemical that, you know, between mother and baby, mm. that the mother's, re- you know, releasing in her brain so she's bonded to that baby. And it's the same thing. In the small amounts, it's the same thing. When you're sharing a meal with someone, you get that similar sort of response. So he was kind of, I felt uh, ostracized and left out of the group. 
Mm. Because he's, you know, and I can understand that if I had a child with allergies, I would probably be wanting my child to be safe and, and keep that away from my child. But at the same time, my kid's got allergies and instead of just sitting there going, oh, well, he's got allergies, what are we going to do about it? Oh, well, the doctor says he's just got allergies for life. We were more empowered to go and make those changes and yeah. we're like, okay, well, we've got to heal the gut. And if we heal the gut, there's a chance that we might not have that allergy to that food in, anymore or we might have you less, know, of more an allergy. Flex, less of an allergy. Mm. Um, so that was kind of our way of thinking. So looking at that and trying to heal William, and he was such an anxious child as well. And if anyone knows, you know, about IBS if, or any of those things, if you're highly stressed, you're not digesting your food. So yeah. the food we were sending, whatever we were getting into him was just going straight through him because he was so concerned and so Aww. worried about, you know, the people he wasn't being allowed to associate with and he already had communication issues and so that was kind of all those little things just built up until one Friday afternoon. It was just like, right, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. I need to find another way. And my other way was sitting quiet and not saying anything to Mark until Sunday night at the dinner table. <laughs> and it was like I was, I, his mum was there. So we had, you know, my mother-in-law was sitting at the table and I just went, right, he's not going to school tomorrow. And Mark put down his fork and, and Mark's mum looked at me and it was just like she got up and moved away because oh, this was dear. getting way too deep in the conversation for her. And, <laughs> and that was it. I was, that's, I'm, not, I'm not backing down. William cannot go to school tomorrow because he's not digesting his food. He can't eat. He's not being integrated. He's so far behind. Like there were all these reasons why he needed to stay home with me and I needed to nourish him. Yeah. And it was just that we we could not do all the healing that we needed to do and be part of the system. So at that time, I just wanted to pull him out mm. to heal him, to get him up to scratch with his education and give him one-on-one -on -one because that's the thing that kept coming back with all his reports is that this child needs one-on-one -on -one, um, mm. education. They need, exactly. you know, more teacher aid time. They need more of this and more of that. I'm like, okay, well, I can do that. I can give that to him. Yeah. I, can, I can do that. And, I, you know, like also I've got a Bachelor of Teaching. Mm -hmm. So, okay, sure, I can do that. I'm, you know, like I spent four years at university learning how to do that. So it wasn't as scary for me. Mm -hmm. So when, you know, people look at me and say, oh, you're a homeschool mum. Oh, that's so scary. Well, no, actually, you know, I'm a teacher first. That was my first vocation and, and I'm still doing it. I just do it yeah. from home. I think so, I found too that mm -hmm. it was so much more stressful for me to send them to school. I was so relieved when they were home. It was it was like the stress was gone from the family. <laughs> yeah, and that perception of stress from the child's point of view yeah. as well. It yeah, doesn't matter how hard yeah. you try and hide it. Everyone still picks up on it. Yeah. So and, and it just get, has a massive impact. I would get impact. comments um, from the William, teacher. William, you used to pace before. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah, so it was, it was a matter that we just couldn't, we didn't fit into the system. It wasn't yeah. fair to the teacher because they're already stressed. They've already got so many kids in the classroom and each kid, you know, there's so many kids that are diagnosed and there's so many kids that are waiting diagnosis and so many kids that um, are struggling because of what they've eaten before or after school or mm. their family problems or, you know, separations and all those life things. Yeah. You know, all that's then put on the teacher and I just sort of thought, hey, look, I'm sick of being that parent that's always putting the hand up and, and oh, well, what about this and what about my child and what yeah. about his education and how are you going to fix this and how are you going to fix that? And I just woke up and just decided, no, well, that's it. The, the best thing I can do for myself and my kid is to pull him out, get him up to scratch, get his gut working, we'll fix him and then we'll send him back. And Well, somehow I forgot the memo on the sending back part yeah. and he's still here at home with us. And now Gabriel, this is his first day of grade one today. Ooh, so it's exciting. Yeah, like we just, we haven't looked back. We really, I really didn't think I'd enjoy it, but it's been such a blessing. And the kids said, well, I thought I was going to go crazy because they're with me 24 seven. I think they're the ones going crazy. They're the ones that are clambering. As soon as someone says, oh, you want to come to the shops? Do you want to come sleep over? You don't come do this. The kids are like tearing to get out of the door to get away from mum. But I'm, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. And that's all that matters. It's all about me. I'm sure um, that they're glad. My kids, I find like people ask them, but don't you want to go to school? They're like, they look at them like they're from another planet. They're like, no, no, <laughs> they love no. homeschooling. Well, Gabriel did think he wanted to go to school. So he, we, I know. Well, he was like, and William's like, you know, Tiggy, you have to sit in a chair if you go to school. And he's like, because he doesn't sit in a chair. He's wiggly like Simmy. <laughs> so he likes to stand and ride. And if I go, like, I can't even get him to sit at the table and eat. 
<laughs> you know, so could you imagine me putting that kid into a classroom? It would be, he would be yes. the kid in the naughty corner and he would be Definitely. the one that would be causing the teacher so much stress yes. and he'd be the one distracting all the other kids, not because he's being naughty. He's not naughty. He's just wiggly and he's yes. busy yes. and he needs that, that movement and that, um, that feedback, I suppose. Uh-huh. I mean, so he'll be able to go back into school if he wants to. Otherwise, you'll just stay here with us at home. And the, the nature of homeschooling is that if you're registered, because, you know, it is, it's legal to homeschool here in Australia. I know in a couple of other countries it's, it's illegal. But we've got so much support here in Australia from, you know, each state has got their own little community and their own little um, legislation of what you have to um, be a part of in order to gain registration. And, yeah, you know, just to be part of that. And you can actually go all the ways from... Um, you know, from where they are now all the way through and do their grade 10 certificate or the grade 12 certificate. So by the time Gabriel actually gets his wriggles out, he might be able to either go back to school and we'll just integrate him then or he'll just go through and finish school and just as a homeschool student, which many, many other people have done before. And I think the most rewarding thing for for where we are at the moment is that this is right for us Mm -hmm. and it feels good and it feels true and our kids are doing really well on it. Yeah. And they're not missing out on anything either because when you're a homeschool family, you have to, you know, like sending them off to those extracurricular stuff, that's mm-hmm. where I get my downtime. Yes, definitely. And a lot of people So what ask about you, Joe? Where do you people, get your downtime? A lot of people ask about that. My kids do a lot of things with other kids and they have soccer and futsal and my daughter works at the stables and they've got church activities and youth club and they're constantly at other people's houses these days it's the older they get the less I see of them (laughs) so (laughs) that was actually another reason that we did start homeschooling because my husband shift works and we would we were finding like when he was on late shift he'd only see them for an hour or so in the day and that's really nothing you know with little kids you just need the time with them they need that time with their parents so that was another reason that we homeschooled um, and now we can. We found it was great because we could fit in around Daddy's schedule. Um, we could go away when he had time off, and it might not necessarily be the school holidays. Um, we could say, okay, well, we're gonna, you know, do something together this morning, and then do school after lunch if we had to, you know, so that it would fit in. But with downtime, mm-hmm. downtime for me, I find yeah, they do have a lot of times. It's definitely like one thing that people have said to me is how can you stand having your kids around you 24-7? Well, I don't. Um, They never have been around me 24-7. And when they're really little, yes, they're here all the time, except I do have my mum close by. And so if I got really tired of, you know, kids and everything, I could just send them down to mum. So I do have a lot of support from my mother and Mm. my sisters were close by up until a couple of years ago and they homeschool as well. I've got a lot of friends that homeschool. There's a really big homeschooling community where I live and um, we all look after each other and help each other out. And Mm -hmm. we've even done homeschool co-ops at times where on a Friday the kids will take turns going to each other's houses so that one Friday I have completely free, another Friday the other mum has completely free and we swap back and forth. Um, So things like that are really helpful. Yeah. Um, We do uh, like when... Other families will come and pick up my kids for sports and take them off to sports and um, look after them for the day and, you know, that helps. So it's definitely not a case of having them all the time under your feet. Mm -hmm. And also, like I said, it's not school all day. So just say most of the schoolwork is generally done by lunchtime and then they're off playing, hardly see them. So my time is in the afternoons. Um, Mm. I get to cook and blog and write and the kids are just in and out now and then but they're not in my in my hair. <laughs> Does that help? Yeah, that's very actually very similar, very mm. similar to how my day is set up. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And the thing I like about the homeschool community, well, it feels like because I, I like, um, you know, that sense of tribe and that sense of connection. So mm. there are Same. people in our community that have got, they've got amazing backstories and amazing yes. skills yep. and being able to identify those people and say, hey, look, can you teach my kids how to do this or yeah. would you run a workshop and then getting out there on the um, homeschool community blog for our area and sort of say, hey, look, 
you know, I like, I love textiles. I love spinning. I've got a spinning wheel. I love mm-hmm. doing quilting. I like doing any of those sorts of things yeah. just to be able to put it out there and say, hey, look, I'm running a workshop. This is the age of the kids. It's going to cost this much. And then, you know, kind of um, bringing them into my world of what I enjoy and mm. I, that, that's what I love. Yeah. So the the vibrancy and the excitement that I'm imparting on that group of kids during that time, it's just, it, it's just amazing. I feel fulfilled because I'm talking about what makes me happy and, and yeah. what pushes all my buttons. But then you know, like when you're in the room with someone who really loves what they what they do, you know, like and it doesn't matter what job it is, mm. if they love it, you're going to love it as well. Yeah. And you're going to feed off their energy. And you can't help but be inspired and jumping all over the place. Yeah. So for me, having other people in the community that I can and palm off to, those to certain responsibilities, like we're in Sydney at the moment and um, so we're at the bottom end of the rocks and the community here is having a big struggle with the government because a lot of this is community housing. These mm. people are being moved on. And to find out all about the history of it, we've gone and done the history tours. We live across the road from one of the oldest pubs in Sydney. We mm-hmm. went and talked to, you know, a lot of the, the you know, the more elderly uh, mm-hmm. locals. And, you know, they've taken the kids for walks around and sort of said, oh, this used to be my playground and this used to be here and this oh, is where wow. the shop was. And, and you know, because they know the history and it's yeah. so much better coming from someone who actually grew up here it as a little, real. a little kid. Yeah. It is real. It makes it real. It just, it's. Yeah, and, and therefore they're, they're learning and understanding that more. And, mm. and if I had taught William about history, you know, like um, Sydney's early history from a book mm-hmm. from Queensland, yeah, he, he wouldn't have got it. But because he's lived here and because he's got these faces and because there's so much art here and there's so many different plaques, there's some always someone to explain to him where the plaque came and when they laid it and, and what that's about. Yes. So farming out those resources to everybody else and, and really making the community um what was that saying what was that thing you said the other day um that it was the the, it takes a village to raise a child (laughs) it takes a village to raise a child it takes a village to raise a child well that's that's what I feel homeschooling it is homeschooling's like for us and for us it's also grandma and grandpa help out with the homeschooling my dad's very good with science and experiments and woodwork and practical stuff well that's good because he has to do the cleanup then yes (laughs) (laughs) and he he's very good with helping the kids with that kind of thing maths very good with maths um and then we have Mm. other friends that um do other things so what we we do have a homeschool group where i live that every thursday there's something going on if people want to go to it we don't go as much now that the kids are older because they're already so busy with extracurricular activities but for a while there i taught an art class through the homeschool group and I taught a cooking class through the homeschool group. And um, that was just, you know, it's just free. It's just sharing. The kids all just came along mm-hmm. and then another mum would teach mm-hmm. something else. One mum taught felting. Um, we'd had, my dad taught soap carving. Um, there was always things going on every Thursday. And that was really good for the kids. And also um, doing public speaking in front of each other, um, singing. So my kids do choir. They go to the nursing home and sing. Um, they have a lot of like they do the Christmas program there every year so there's a lot of things that kids can do if they get out into the community I mean if you wanted to you could put your kids into the local theatre group I know my friend who homeschools all her kids are in the theatre group and they are amazing they've been all in all the musicals and you know so um, just depending on what your kids love another another family um, friends of ours that homeschool their kids are very musical so their schooling is very much built around music and their kids, uh, like especially the eldest one, she's getting, well, she's not the eldest, sorry, she's the second girl. She's um, 17 and she's already starting to teach music this year because she's amazingly talented. So she's already got her work sorted out for her mm-hmm. um, because she was able to focus on yeah. the direction that she most loved. She could focus on that and um you know, she didn't have to try and do everything at once. She could slow down on the maths and English a bit during the time of exams for music and really focus on her music and then get back into the maths and English a bit more once the exams were done. So she's really taken off with her music. So I think that's one good thing about homeschooling is you can find what their bent is and really encourage that. Um, and that's that's one of the things I love. Mm-hmm. That totally went off track there. but. Mm. <laughs> 
We expected oh. that, didn't we? No. <laughs> yeah, we did expect that. Hey, well, get back, getting back on track, yes. I put a thing up on Facebook and I actually forgot. I put a call out there that I was, you know, mm-hmm. we were doing a homeschool thing and I asked questions. I said, does anyone have any questions? I put yes. that up on my Facebook page. I completely forgot to check it before I oh, did you? started recording this podcast. So I'm hoping heaps. that you did something like that. What yes. have you got? Like what's I've something that well, we can answer for someone? I think we should start. start. <laughs> we're halfway through. But I think we should definitely talk about socialization because I think that's probably people's biggest concern with homeschooling although if you've listened to us already okay. talking you probably realize that our kids are quite you know out there they're already well, socializing constantly <laughs> well okay well I, like, I know that Isaac with his his problem and his health problems and, mm-hmm. and those his anxiety and his OCD um and the struggle that he went through with socialization uh, William went through the same thing yeah. um to a point where it's not about for will he social exhaustion is all I can if when I was sending him to school he'd come home and he'd pace on the brick wall mm. um, up and t- retaining wall for you know between 30 and 50 times before he could come inside mm. just because he was processing what happened in the day and when something traumatic happened in the day um, or you know traumatic to him you know not traumatic to anyone else but his perception of what was going on in school was often vastly different to what yeah. the other kids it's too real for him it was mm. you know like if someone said I'm going to get you and then pretended to have guns then for William his perception was they're going to kill me mm. they've got guns so for him he was just it was too real for him because he is that those two years behind mm. everybody else. So even though he's now ten, he's actually still, you know, eight and a half, nearly nine in his head and as far as that social development and he's catching up. But for him it was social exhaustion. So for me sending him to school all day and then coming home, he would be in protection mode. Yes. I suppose. He'd have his hands on his ears, he'd have his eyes closed most of the time, just because he was so sensory and there was too much coming at him. Yeah. So being a homeschool mum it's allowed us to pick and choose where he's going to get the most rewarding and most fulfilling um, access to social engagement. So mm. he can prepare himself. He can transition into that. He knows that we're going to go to drama and it's only a few, you know, like a, a block from our house. We're going to walk down there. He's going to see those kids. They're going to do this program. Yes. And he's got his small group of friends. And it's like he does really well going to the playground with a group of kids. But if you put him in a whole classroom, there are too many bodies, there are too many personalities, he's overwhelmed with that. And that's not a great socially um, engaging thing for him to participate in. Mm. And even giving him five minutes in that, he's not going to learn anything because he's completely shut down. Mm. Whereas if we can pick somewhere like where we've got a nice, you know, calm group of kids, it's still kind of led by an instructor but it's still so organic and so free and and dramatic Mm -hmm. and all those other things then his social engagements are you know even though we he's not spending as much time with kids Mm. he's getting just as much benefit from that small little bit of interaction so it's not about I suppose what I'm saying it's not about the quantity and leaving the house and engaging all the time it's about the quality it's about giving him rewarding experiences to then pick himself up from his previous poor experiences and creating new fond memories of those things and sort of breaking down the walls where he would be otherwise um the anxiety or the concern or you know that lead to the transitional issues Mm. so I, i suppose that's all i can really add to that one (laughs) <laughs> um, I think it was a bit long winded, wasn't no, that's it? That's all right. That's all right. I think um, with socialization, <laughs> a lot of people feel like they, if they're not setting their kids to be with other kids their age group, then mm. they're not learning how they should be. I don't know at that age. I don't know. But to me, that doesn't make sense. I want my kids to live in the real world. I want them to be mm-hmm. able to interact with all ages. I don't want them to only be able to interact with their age group. I know when I was at high school. If my little sister dared to come and say hello to me at high school, I'd be like, go away, go away, because it just was not cool to talk to younger kids. And I don't want my kids to be like that. I mean, obviously I grew out of that, but Mm. um, I want my kids to be able to interact with any age, whether it's a grandmother in the nursing home, which is why we encourage our kids to go to the nursing home and visit, or whether it's a little three-year-old who comes over to play. I don't want them turning their back on them and saying, go away. I want them to interact. And 
so, but also to know which is appropriate play. You know, like if right. you're in grade six and you're playing with a grade three kid, then you have to know how to play with a grade three kid. That's right. And I can understand at school they have to keep them in the peer groups because otherwise there could be accidents or whatever. That's I understand yes. that. But it's so much easier in a family and home and close friends and cousins and neighbourhood environment that they're getting to play with all different kids. They're getting to sit at the table and listen to adults chatting and learn when they can talk and when they can't talk. And, you know, um, I think there's a good quote. Yeah, learn to adapt the conversation style as well. There's a good quote from a book um, by Raymond and Dorothy Moore. Um, It's a book called School Can Wait. And it says, Many parents confuse peer orientation and dependence with sociability when instead true sociality thrives on secure, independent thought. And I thought, I think, you know, with kids, they need to be able to think for themselves, not just follow the pack. And they also need to not just be blindly following their peers because that's what we do at this age and that's what, you know, oh, all the kids are trying smoking cigarettes. Well, I've got to try it or I'm not cool. Mm. I'm I'm so glad to not have to be in that peer pressure thing. Um, my kids are quite independent <laughs> and sometimes, you know, people think, okay, they're homeschoolers, they're a bit odd. Hey, they're independent th- thinkers, they're not odd. <laughs> but they are learning to fit no, into society. No, <laughs> okay. my kids are odd. My kids are odd. Well, but, so, you know, some like, of mine are odd. <laughs> it's, it's that oddity that makes them, them different and interesting. Yeah. So, And as you know, they like, grow and, up, that often leads to very creative jobs because they're not mm-hmm. scared to be different. Yeah. You know? Yeah, they've had that, that freedom. Yeah. What else What else did you have on your little list? I wish I printed mine out. I can't believe I, oh, actually, I've got I can it believe I did that. I, I was just thinking, <laughs> I just wanted to mention too that all yeah. socialisation isn't positive. Like I know a mm. lot of people say at school it's good to have your kids in school to um, go through negative social experiences, bullying, harassment, things like that because that's real life. Yeah. I don't really believe that. I think it's better to face these issues when you're more mature. And, I mean, uh-huh. you will face them in small ways at home and in your neighbourhood and amongst your, your own friends. You know, kids come over and they bully your kid. That happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but they've got your support there. They've got the strength of, um, you know, the backup of their family. They've got – they're learning to have a good self self-image – yeah. Um, so that they can deal with that kind of thing and, and know, well, that's rubbish. I know that what they're saying is not true, so I'm not going to listen. Yeah. Um, so I think that's... It, and I think that it's really hard for schools in general to deal with something like that. Yeah. Each school has got their own bullying policy and their own mm-hmm. thing. I think that, um, you know, like the, the parent and how the parent deals with that at home and having mm. those experiences happen at the park or happen at home and getting them learning and being able um, to know, talk in it that through environment. together. Well, that's right. And work through it is, you know, much, much better than having to um, learn that in a school environment where, I mean, just speaking from a parent's point of view, it, it's better coming from myself or another parent rather than coming from a school that has, mm. you know, like ties with, you know, this is the way we've got to do this. This is workplace health and safety. This is legislation. This is all those other things. They need those things and those processes in place. And I can understand that. But when they're in our environment, in our domain, it's all coming from that place of love and yeah. surety, mm-hmm. I think. And as they grow, we let them out more and more into the big wide world and they learn more and more. But it's starting off, you, you sort of start off with them close and then you gradually, you know, they're going out more and more and getting more and more of the experiences that will help them to be an adult in the real world. But they're still yeah. going through real world stuff at home. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, yeah. Um, I think also, uh, there was something else I was thinking of, but anyway, yeah, just basically that I don't think socialization is the big issue that people think it is. As long as you're getting out there with your kids, meeting new people, doing things together, um, getting the kids to sports and things or theater or whatever, that's really good for them. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Do you have a rainstorm there? I do. It has just started raining really heavily. <laughs> I can hear it. Lovely. <laughs> That's all right. We can keep going. <laughs> we can keep going. I hope we can. I hope it's not too loud. <laughs> so did you want to bring up something else then besides um, um, that? No, no. I, actually, well, 
I suppose with that socialisation, the homeschooling, and you sort of covered it working around um, with Dave and his schedule and his work and, and those sorts of things, for us it's really important that we both share the teaching roles. Mm-hmm. So Mark's here for, you know, certain things and I'm there for other certain things because I do things really well and he does other things really well. Yeah. And, and making sure that the kids are learning from both parents. Yeah, because they will um, whether you mean to or not. <laughs> well, that's right. That's right. And my skill set, you know, is, you know, I've, there's things that I'm great at but there's things that Mark is just brilliant at. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got more time and more patience when it comes to explaining math. So if there's anything that William doesn't understand, then I can always refer him to someone else. But just to it sort of reinforces that we're part of a team, you know, we're going to work through this as a family. Right. And there's always someone else you can depend on within your family or within your community. And I know that schools do that as well. Um, but it's kind of, it's a little more um, insular and it's a little more um, nurturing, I suppose, mm. from my perspective. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. No, I haven't really got anything else I, I can sort of say on that. I haven't really prepared anything. It was all no, on the okay. computer and I forgot. That's all right. <laughs> so um, should we mention uh, the dis- difference between homeschooling and distance ed? Sure, sure. Um, so you can actually register and do, if anyone else is interested in, in checking out homeschooling for themselves or just wants to put their foot in or doesn't think that, um, you know, just to give the kids some time out or give the kids a different experience and they think that they want to try out uh, schooling from home and set up a classroom from home, you can actually register through, I think there's a couple of state government ones, um, which is just like a classroom you actually have teachers and session times that you can Skype in for and, and you're still part of a community, kind of like school of the air. Yeah. So you, you can participate in those sorts of things. Um, so that's classified as distance education. Um, and then there are other people like there's you can order books and, and what was the school? You were signed up with a school as well. Yeah, we were signed up with Jubilee, um, which is the local private school. But now, yeah. now we've we've actually decided to go with the government homeschool program so yeah. that you can be a lot more flexible with yeah. curriculums and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So I think importantly, the resources, I think that, um, you know, the resources and textbooks that you would use in classrooms, we're still using those at home. They're still pre-printed media. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're not creating everything from scratch. We just pick and choose what we want yes. to make it sit suit the individual child and you can Um, get what we did early on was get uh, someone through a private school to do an assessment of each child um, so that we could work out their learning style and that really mm. helps too because it's going to um, help you decide what curriculums you use and I didn't use the same curriculum for all the kids I changed Mm -hmm. it around depending on the child because some of them suit different things a highly individualized approach isn't it yeah And just, yeah, and I mean, as a parent, you're spending all that time with them. You get to know what their strengths and weaknesses are and what they yeah. love and what they don't like and, and being able to create a curriculum and a program around that, just that all-encompassing learning environment. Yeah. It's just, it's a little different. I know that schools um, have IEPs for each, you know, individual learning programs for mm-hmm. each child and they have all their outcomes and we're doing exactly the same thing. I, I suppose mm-hmm. that's what I want to communicate is that yeah. we're doing exactly the same things that you do in a classroom. Ours are just slightly different, um, but we've got the same outcomes. And as far as legislation, we have to have outcomes because that's, you know, a, a national requirement, Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Um, some people have asked, where do I begin? I think a lot of times it's really good to go and find your local homeschool group. There is usually a homeschool group in an area. And um, mm-hmm. if you go online, sometimes on Facebook is a good place to find them um, yeah. because they'll have a group on there. Um, and you can find out a lot of information for you that's um, local because, like Leah was saying, states have different legislations. You can obviously contact um, your Yeah, contact the state. state. They yeah. usually know um, the bigger homeschooling groups. So that's right, in New yeah. South Wales here, we've got Shin, which is Sydney you know, homeschooling something. Um, Sydney Educational Network, so S-H-E-N. So you can contact them and join their little um, forum yep. and you can sit back and watch and ask them questions yeah. and, and those sorts of things. I just think that's to, a really good way to get started because then you get real answers. <laughs> yeah, things well, you that do. mums want to know. Likewise with Facebook, how it all fits together. Mm. And the other thing I found really surprising is that 
a lot of the people in my community are doing um, homeschooling instead of sending the kids to say prep or pre-prep or any of those mm -hmm. other things. They're starting to incorporate those learning things and keeping their kids home just that little bit longer just because before it's they send such them off to grade one. Yeah, because it's such an early start, isn't it? It is. It is an early start, and thing. because they're blessed with that, you know, like the the gift of time, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, it's kind of yeah a lot like play group for them yeah and and if you go through a group you can ask them what curriculums they use what they found has worked for them what did they use for learning to read all that kind of thing so that you get some practical advice from each other uh-huh um, and there's a lot of sharing as well quite yeah. often the resources like once I'm finished with the resources then yes, we, you know, like I put them, them up for sale or, yeah. you know, like you just trade with someone else. So there's a lot of that cost sharing, I yeah, suppose, definitely. in the community. Not that mm. I've ever been able to sell my Sunlight books. They're too lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so um, someone did ask, was your husband always on board with homeschooling or did he need persuading? Oh, mine wasn't. <laughs> mine wasn't either. He needed persuading. <laughs> but I think when they... When they started to see, well, with mine, started to see other children that had done so well with homeschooling, they'd gone off to uni, they were perfectly fine, um, mm. they didn't have, they weren't backwards, they weren't unsocialized, they were very easy to talk to, um, they were clever, you know, I think that really helped me and that also helped my husband because I realized hey, it's actually about how you raise your kids as to how they turn out, it's not necessarily whether they homeschool or don't. Mm -hmm. But there's a real fear also that you're going to miss something as a homeschooling yeah. parent. Am I going to cover everything that's on mm. the syllabus? Am I going to be able to meet all the needs that, you know, the national and state authorities mm -hmm. deem are, are important? So, and it is, it's kind of scary mm. that you've got to hit all those things as well and make sure that they're uh, well-rounded in their education. So, you know, and if you've always been in that mainstream idea of this is schooling mm. and this is how it's done, to... For us to have the wheels fall off the apple cart and I'm just you know like I'm done I can't do it anymore and then have to go and look for something else that first 12 months for me I was on pins and needles for the mm. whole 12 months and I think I made my program bigger and harder than it needed to be yeah and I overdid it everything I overcompensated everything and I made it I made a rod for my back and just learning you know how much time everything took how to cover those things how to do your testing how to do your reporting and all those other things like that's a journey in its own mm. but it's it's not like it's not achievable no it's it's you know there's so many and it's just growing as a community so once you understand that I think I drove Mark mad in the first 12 months because I was so <laughs> neurotic about it but at, you know at the end of the day once I got into my flow and once I started to understand this and once I became more um, empowered as you know a mother and you know, as a teacher and, you know, all those other things that just sort of came together and then a homeschooling community, you get out there and you start meeting these other women like yourself, Joe, that have yeah. got more children that have been on the journey longer than you and the older ones are taking the younger ones along and it's we do this and we do that and try this and this is – and then, you know, you start getting the text messages, this is on sale at Target and this is over here and this is where you get that it's all encompassing and everyone starts sharing and it, mm. it comes back to that sense of community um that we've built for ourselves yeah and and it's you know like it's sisterhood One and there's thing. fathers too there's fathers at our play groups there's yeah, fathers yeah, at definitely. our community events you know like take an rdo and and you know hey daddy can come along and do this yeah that's right it's we've brilliant. had we've had um aboriginal tour guide take us through the rainforest and daddy had to come to that one because we did all the bush tucker stuff that was really good oh, of course because yeah. that's his that's his special interest area loves, isn't yeah. it he all loves the, all of that sort he of stuff he loves teaching the boys the camping self self-sufficiency survival type stuff <laughs> yeah he needs to he needs to run a meetup i'm coming up for that i'm bringing my kids if he's going to run a survival camp i'm coming up i'll bring my kids <laughs> okay the um one one thing i was just thinking of a book that was really good for me with relaxing a bit I think like you said you were really worried about doing everything right um, a book that I read by Ruth B. Chick called The Three R's that's from starting kids from really young and realizing that they learn so much through play when they're little and mm -hmm. that it doesn't have to be this like super structured learning they will actually learn a lot through everyday experiences and play and that and explaining how that works and 
um, that really took a load off me because I realized there's a lot of things that I already do. Like when I'm cooking, right from the times the kids were little, I would have them by my side explaining what I was doing and how so that it wasn't just get out of the kitchen, you're in the way. It was, hey, this mm-hmm. is how we cut, this is how we peel carrots and this is mm-hmm. this is why we put this in our food and why we don't use this and and that's very much the Montessori system yes. isn't it of, of modeling real world situations yeah. and inclusion and that's how I homeschool mostly is the natural learning um, everything I'm doing right from the time they were tiny I was talking them through it mm. uh, and that's how they've learnt a lot of the you know the very practical things and obviously you still have to do the maths and English and all that kind of thing but um, a lot of stuff you already know, you already know it and you will just naturally teach it if you've got them there by your side making a conscious decision to talk them through whatever you're doing. Yeah, yeah. well, um, just on a parallel to that, mm-hmm. um, I went to a public speaking thing and I really don't like public speaking or I didn't <laughs> like public speaking. I just felt that every time I opened my mouth I was going to say something stupid or I felt like I was being attacked or for whatever my point of view was. But then I realized that, hey, I've been speaking my entire life. Yes. I, I already know how to speak. What's the <laughs> difference between, between that? And it's the same with kids. You know, like I already learned these things because I am who I am and I'm where I am today. Mm. I've learned those things. So shouldn't I then be a great advocate to be able to impart that information yeah. onto my own child? Exactly. So that's kind of where I'm coming from now. I, you know, I can say that in confidence now. Um, but that first year, that was really hard. It was very, very hard for me to step outside of my comfort zone and realize the big picture and actually realize that I can do this and anyone can do this. Yes, that's right. If they want this, anyone can do this. It's not a hard thing. It doesn't take up the whole vastness of the day. No. Yes, you need structure and yes, you need commitment, Mm. but aside from that, you just need to want have the kids around all the time and you need to want to feel like you are the best person for the job. Yep. That confidence. I I think that leads on to another question that I've had, which is how in the world do you do it all? How do you juggle homeschool, home business, Mm -hmm. blog, traveling, um, babies, all of that? And how do you look after yourself as a mother, you know, as a woman, as yourself? How do you look after yourself and have time out? And we did talk a bit about the time out, but um, I'll give you a few of my tips and then maybe you could give a few of yours because. Well, I have to think of some. Okay, well, I'll talk while you think. Um, Okay. So I started right from, I was working from home from the time I had, just before I had my first baby, I started working from home as a graphic artist so that I would be able to work as well as be at home with my baby. And um, to do that, I used a routine so that I had a flexible routine that I had my babies on right from word go so that they, I always basically knew when I would have downtime that I could spend on my job. I would book clients in at that time. I would take phone calls at that time. I would answer emails and do work at that time. So they would have sleep times and they would have time in the playpen and they would have times, um, you know, with daddy or with grandma. And so obviously with kids that has to be flexible, but I did have some sort of structure. And I think that's really important Um, right from the time they're little is get some structure into their lives when Kids actually thrive on structure. If they know what's happening next, um, they're a lot happier than if it's just all over the place. They get really cranky, I find, when it's just whatever, whenever. Um, Mm. I also found it was good to make sure I had downtime for myself structured in. So um, after lunch, every day, right from the time the kids were little, and even now, I still really do it, unless, unless I've got one of those super crazy days where I can't. But generally, um, after lunchtime is everybody, leave everyone else alone. You've got to go to your room, sit on your bed, lay down, have a rest, read a book. Um, These days, the kids might still be doing some schoolwork. If they're not, they need to be quiet at least. Um, When they were little, it was like rest time in the cot with some toys and hopefully they'd go to sleep and usually they would. When they were a bit older, it was um, a few books on your bed and you stay there for 45 minutes or an hour, depending on how old they were. And during that time, I would ha- oftentimes I'd have a little nap, 20-minute nap because I was just tired, or I would um, do some reading, do something for me, um, do something that would sort of get my energy levels up again. 
So I've always done that. And and when it's a really busy day and I can't do half an hour or whatever, I'll just take a cup of tea and go sit outside, stick my feet in the grass and five or ten minutes and tell the kids don't bother Mm -hmm. me, mummy needs some some quiet. (laughs) Um, And I find that that's really important, especially for a homeschooling mum, that you do have to have times where you can have a break um, and go off by yourself a bit. Um, Probably another... Uh huh. I'm doing exactly the same thing. Yeah. At the moment, that's oh, how it, with the podcasting. That's yes. it's it's the same thing. It's the structure. It's yeah. Okay. Let's let's all plan to be done by um twelve thirty one o'clock, and then mm-hmm. I give them their their lunch. Yeah. And it's like, okay, don't talk to me now because I'm talking to Joe. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like everyone scurries downstairs, and I don't know what they're up to down there, but there's no fighting, <laughs> and you know, like they know that this is mummy time. This yeah. is mummy's outlet. She gets to talk to another adult person about yes. real things. Yes. And don't come in the kitchen because it's the mummy zone and that's my downtime and they get used to that. And I think they they do and my kids know if mummy says I'm very tired and I need to have a rest, don't bang on my door unless it's someone's dying, you know. (laughs) So they just leave me in my room and they'll go and do other things, clean up the kitchen if it's a mess quite often, you know, especially if they know I'm really, really tired, they'll actually Mm -hmm. really pitch in and, and do some things for me and... Um, that's it's nice when you can get to that stage and I know your kids are still a bit young yet but they will get there because you're on the right track <laughs> do you promise that they'll I get promise. there because I really want that that yes. would be just awesome <laughs> and and that's all it's all about raising them from really young to be caring and helpful around the house and all that and then they do get to that stage where they're just they think about these things and help out so it's good <sighs> Yay! Yay. <laughs> I can't wait for the future. Yay! <laughs> and then I must admit, I do work at night on my blog and business because um, once everyone's in bed, I can actually think to write. So I know I try to go to bed um, early ish every second night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're not... still having problems even on the health coaching front about you going to bed yeah. at the right time. Hey, aren't I've, we? Been, I've been trying to go to bed by 10 at. <laughs> That's that's oh, early look, for me. That that is early for you. Yeah. I have to admit that's heaps better than what you and were I've been, doing. And I've been getting up at five thirty. So. You can have a gold star, Joe. Thank you. And so <laughs> I get up. I get up at five thirty, and I sit on the couch, and I read, and I have quiet time, and then I, I write down my list of what I need to do for the day, and I start answering emails, and that, I love mm. that time of day. Yeah. So you just because there's have no to, one else up. That's right. Except for the bird who sits in the cage making the phone ringing noises and saying, hello, Fred. <laughs> oh, is he speaking already? He's still a baby. Yeah, he speaks. He, he does the phone ringing and says, hello, Fred, hello, Fred, until I get him up. <laughs> anyway, that was, what do you do for, for juggling everything and having downtime besides the podcast? <laughs> besides the podcast. Well, it's like... It's the art of misdirection. It's like we're doing this, but it's smoke and mirrors we're actually doing. This. Yeah. Um, so I'm still, because my kids are still a bit younger, um, yeah, I haven't got so much structure in the downtime. And because I'm in Sydney, I haven't, well, I'm, I'm away from my family for the next three years at least. Mm. I haven't really got, you know, the people that I can and palm them off to or to get that better downtime. But it's the quality that you do get. And if it takes me all day just to get that five or ten minutes, mm. I'm, I'm putting my headphones on and I'm listening to some music or, you know, like yeah. I'm doing a bit of meditation and just some reflecting. And, and like you said, I get up 5.30 in the morning and mm. I'm, I'm doing my writing in the morning, um, just trying to sort myself out for the day and, yeah. and process, you know, that emotional yes. dialogue that's going on inside my head and, yep. and understanding where everyone else is coming from and making sure everyone's me- needs are met. Um, but for me, I sit there and I draw. I know you're a big fan of drawing. Yes. I draw um, and scribble and doodle and, you know, like I'm not going to go and put it on an art show or anything and hardly yeah. any of my drawings get finished. <laughs> but it's just the fact it's that therapeutic. it is just to draw on a piece of paper and I think also writing yes. just in general, just using a pen, yes. just having that fluid motion across the page is just so cathartic and it it's is. just, um just so rejuvenating to be sitting there with a cup of herbal tea and doing that and it you know like I only need five or ten minutes and I'm good and I'm ready to go again yeah so but I'm not I'm not racing to get out of the house I think that's the the difference between yeah what I'm doing and and say what my my old life used to be yeah. was that okay I get out of bed and I'm like right I know William's transitional issues he's going to not want to go to school he's going to be stressed he's going to be crying and you know like 
when you take a kid to school, you expect them to cry and do that for a couple of weeks. Mm. But this is like every day for 12 months. Yeah, and awful. you know, as soon as you get in the, so that's what it's going to, so I get up in the morning and I would be stressed about that. And I've got to get him in the car and I've got to make the lunch. Is he going to eat the lunch? Have we done the homework? Have we got the, you know, the, yeah. the homework folder? Have we got the library bag? Have we got everything else that's associated with that? And he would lose those things. He's one of those kids that mm-hmm. he just oh, has no sounds like Simi. <laughs> executive functioning problems. You yes. know, just can't do the most simple thing. Um, and then doing all that. So just getting my old life was getting out of bed and being so stressed. And before mm. I even started the day, I was like, oh, I've got to do it again. How am I going to manage this? And what obstacles are going to be in the way? And it was just wasn't a rewarding outcome yeah. for anyone because of this, the card we were dealt. Mm-hmm. So now I don't have that problem. So I get up in the morning and I'm like, righto, the first thing I'm going to do is me. Yep. And the last thing I'm going to go to bed is me. Yep. <laughs> you know, like it's, I, okay, I haven't got that break during the day, but, you know, they're still kids. They've got to go to bed on time. And yeah. once they're settled, that's when I get that rejuvenating downtime where yeah. I can I can get on the spinning wheel. And yep. uh, I'm just watching that thing go around and around in circles. And when you're, if you're a spinner, I don't know how many people spin, but if you're a spinner, you're using your leg and a pedal and that's, you know, like it's momentum. Yeah. And there's a fluid that goes with it. It's, it's almost musical, I suppose. Mm. And then you start rocking. And it's just, it's therapeutic and, it and that's creative and it's, and I don't have to think about it. My mind just goes blank. And for me, that's a form of meditation because, it's you know, like it's just all that um, automatic sort of uh, movement and creativity mm-hmm. is all happening in the that, one process. I find that with drawing that I just sort of go into another zone and it's very relaxing. It's like your mind can just slow right down and it's all about what your hands are doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it could be knitting, it could be crochet, it could be, you know, like there's so many talented mm. people out there that have got these little things that they do whilst they're watching TV or, mm-hmm. you know, that, that bring that and oh. you only need that short little bit of that. If you can tap into that, then the rest of the world is golden. I should mention TV because that's a big thing. Um, people say, how do you find time? I don't watch TV. So yeah, um, yeah. people often... I'm actually really puzzled on how anyone has time to watch TV myself. <laughs> I don't have any time to watch TV. Um, every bit of the day is, is filled unless I'm having a nap maybe. But it's just... Um, I don't think the yeah. TV went on the entire time I was at your place. I no. stayed at your place three and a half days and not once did your kids have the TV on. No. Now and then we'll watch a, like a video or something, DVD. Yeah, but we not have very often. A, a movie a, night once a yeah, week. Yeah, like a movie night. But even that doesn't happen so much. Um, the kids like to play games on the computer and stuff, and I'll give them a time limit. But for me mm-hmm. myself, I just can't be bothered with all that. As soon as I've got spare time, it's obviously the internet is my TV, I guess, because I'm on there answering questions and um, researching and writing. So mm-hmm. that's what I do instead of TV. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Well, do you think that that's, do you that's think we've about, covered everything? Yeah, I think we should probably stop because I actually have to go to the dentist now. That's very sad. <laughs> no, it's not. Not if you've got a good dentist. Yeah, I have a very good dentist. He's actually into natural stuff, Ooh, so it's good. I like those kind. They're yeah. around there. They're out there. <coughs> yeah. You just have to ask them. You go in and you square them up and you say, right, take off the white coat and put the rainbow yes. on. Yeah. Give it. Give yes. me the real deal. I want to know how to repair the enamel on my teeth. Come on, baby. The only problem is he's retiring very soon, so I'm going to have to find another one. No, no. I'm sure he can work from home. He'll yeah. want to keep his hand in. He'll want to keep it. Yeah. Maybe we can we'll work that. on that. Yeah. But thank you so much, and that was no, good to have a chat No, thanks very about. much. Oh, did you want to explain, um, if people want to know about where to get information from, the Queensland oh. Government has... Yeah. Um, yeah education.queensland.government.au backslash parents backslash yep. home education well we can put backslash. the link up <laughs> yeah we um, will do so that so if people just type in heu if you're in queensland or actually if you're in any other state and you i mean I, I like the queensland one because that's what i know yeah so i'm using that as an example but heu are great and you just ring them up and they've got people there and they'll talk you through the process and explain outcomes and they'll tell you about resources and meetup groups and yep. that's what they're there for they're there to support in every state they've got a different one of those so I'm just using HTU because that's, that's, that's what I know yeah. mm-hmm. and now that I'm in Sydney I've got to go make friends with the Board of Studies New South Wales I haven't done that yet okay um, so I'll have to do that soon but you've got who else have you got um, any of the you know the Australian 
homeschool, uh, Australian, I just Australian Christian Homeschool is yep. one of the ones that, that I've seen and also Australian Homeschooling Supplies yes. out of Melbourne. They are really good as well with Aust- information. There's an Australian lady that has a blog and I can't remember her name but she's all about homeschooling and if you just put Australian Homeschooling um, or Homeschooling in Australia, you'll probably find her but she has a lot of stuff about how to begin, how to get registered, all the different options for registering for homeschooling so there's a lot of stuff online if you just Google it. Yeah, there's heaps and heaps of stuff. Um, yeah. But we'll have that in our notes. In our links as well, yeah. Won't we? So yeah. I'll, we'll have to go and find that lady yes. and put her okay. stuff up as well. Yeah. But there's heaps of information. And it's like what we've said today, it's just it's perfect for us and our situation. So mm-hmm. we're not down on the school system because no. there are so many kids that are absolutely thriving in the school system and, and doing really well. And we both but, know lots of lovely teachers too. Oh, yeah, and they do really well, but they honestly, they are so stressed because of the workload that they've got. Yeah, so we're helping to Um, reduce that. We're helping (laughs) to reduce that. (laughs) Um, And we're doing it our own way, and and that's what it all comes down to. For me, it's like health. You do your health how it best suits you in your own way with intuition, and education is just the same for us in that respect. So, yeah. yeah. So thank you, everyone, for listening. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask on our Facebook pages or on our websites. Um, Mine is Quirky Cooking and Leah's is Akesis Balance, A-K-E-S-I-S Balance. Dot com. Dot com. And um, we'd love to hear from you. You can find more of our podcasts on the wellnesscouch.com backslash a quirky journey. And we'd love for you to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and also check out the other podcasts on the Wellness Couch. They've got all sorts. And I know. There's some good ones. Yeah. And the Abnormal Psychologist, Joe. I haven't Ooh. even listened to hers. Is that good, is it? Yeah. Um, okay. Carrie Casey Thompson. I met her husband on the Gold Coast. Uh-huh. He's just beautiful. They've got an organic whole food store oh, wow. um, in Queensland. I'm not, I can't remember exactly where. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's probably just west of, um, the Gold Coast, uh-huh. um, on the way to Toowoomba somewhere out there. But I tell you, she is just, she's incredible. The people that she's been interviewing and the conversation Ooh. she's had, oh, just so inspiring. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you everyone. And, um, hopefully you've gotten some ideas for homeschooling if that's what you came to find out. Um, we will be back with more gut related podcasts after this, but we thought we'd just pop that one in there as a bit of a change because we can <laughs> well and it still because we were back asked. to gut health hey? it did we just we the just anxiety, can't help ourselves the gut health and the schooling it was That's just right. it's all tied in it's That's all part right. of the therapy it is all right thanks joe thanks leah and we'll see you next week bye bye this has been a production of the check us out on facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com forward slash the wellness couch Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Whilst the Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Wellness Couch podcasts.